Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Fish. Good evening. I'm Andy Fish, the Executive Director of Advamed DX, the trade association representing the leading manufacturers of diagnostic tests, including advanced molecular diagnostics. Advamed DX supports the essential and growing role that molecular diagnostics play in earlier and more precise diagnosis of disease, more effective evaluation and management of health risks, and critical decision making about patient treatment and care. It is essential that patients and clinicians better understand the power of diagnostics, and we applaud the Society for Women's Health Research for its recognition of the importance of molecular diagnostics. Genomic and proteomic testing are transforming healthcare and will be the cornerstone of personalized medicine. Tonight, I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Larry Cahill, one of the most influential leaders in studying sex differences in the brain. Dr. Cahill is a professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at the University of California, Irvine, where he is currently examining biological sex influences on brain function. He also has been a longtime leader in the area of the brain and memory and has made important discoveries about sex influences on emotional memory. Dr. Cahill is an internationally regarded and dynamic speaker, and his work has been ex highlighted extensively in the media, including in the New York Times, the London Times, and PBS. He was most recently featured on CBS's 60 Minutes for his expertise, and he has been actively engaged with WHR for many years on the importance of research into sex differences. Please welcome Dr. Larry Cahill. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here and just to be part of the, the effort. When they asked me to do this um, a couple weeks ago, uh, I said yes, and shortly thereafter they said, oh, Dr. Cahill, a um, couple things. You've got eight minutes and you can't use any slides. <laughs> now, if you want to freak out a scientist, tell him he's got eight minutes and he can't use any slides. Then they told me I had to use this readatron thing here, and I said, no, no, I'm old school. <laughs> uh, I, I have about eight minutes, and someone's going to be giving me this sign at some point. I don't know where she is. Uh, but I have eight minutes to try and do the impossible, which is to try and capture why it is that the issue of sex differences is so important for brain science. Um, but I, I accept the challenge. Uh, when, when uh, I, I, as they mentioned, I, 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 because it's a, a, a topic that journalists care about, I'm, I'm interviewed fairly often. And they always ask me, Dr. Cahill, is it really true? Are the brains of men and women different? The way that's not the funny part yet. <laughs> and I, my answer is yes. And then I say, ask me whether or not the brains of men and women are very similar. And I say, they do, and I say the answer is yes. And if the interview doesn't end at that point, uh, I go on to explain that this issue is, is, is complicated in part because men and women, their brains, their bodies are similar in many respects and different in other respects. And it's the different part that remains to this day understudied and the reason societies like the Society for Women's Health Research are so important. I'm gonna try and capture in just a few minutes with just two examples why sex differences is so important for the brain. One that has to do with Alzheimer's disease, one that has to do with stroke. Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the people who study Alzheimer's disease, of course, want to know what genes predispose you to getting Alzheimer's disease. You might want to know what genes predispose you to getting Alzheimer's disease. And there's a certain gene called ApoE. You don't need to know anything about it, other than it's the gene that more than any other has been associated with Alzheimer's disease risk. Well, it turns out it was discovered about 20 years ago that that's not equally true in men and women. It's way more true in women. It's much worse to be a woman and have this form of the ApoE gene. Now, strangely, in the intervening 20 years, that fact has not moved center stage in the Alzheimer's field. Uh, there was a group from Stanford that published a paper just a couple years ago where they followed up on this, and they said, quote, this gender effect has been completely buried and it raises a bunch of concerns about research and clinical work, it sure does. If you're clumping the men and women together in your study but you have a, a wildly different risk, 
then you're going to be coming to false conclusions, not just for the women, but for the men as well. So APOE is the first thing I wanted to tell you about. And, 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 and so are there sex differences of note that we need to concern ourselves with when it comes to Alzheimer's disease? Yes, there are. Are we doing, in my opinion, an adequate job of doing that at this point? My answer is no. The second example I want to give you has to do with stroke. And I have absolutely no idea how much time I have left. But I'm just, I'm just going to try and keep it under eight minutes. Second, second example has to do with stroke. Uh, ask a neurologist, there's probably some in the room, what drugs do we have to help prevent brain damage after stroke? And the answer is not much. And amazingly enough, I've found out really only in the last year that we do have a drug. Remember, we have a class of drugs, and they have a name, Lazaroids, literally after the biblical figure Lazarus, who rose from the dead. So restorative are these drugs, so effectively did they work in preventing brain damage after certain kinds of stroke, in particular subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now you may be wondering, how come you haven't heard of these drugs? The answer is that they weren't approved by the FDA. They were developed in the 90s by the Upjohn Company. And uh, I first learned about this really about 10 years ago when I published an article in Scientific American on sex differences in the brain. And a letter appeared a couple months later from a retired chemist from Upjohn. And he had this to say. Cahill suggests that gender differences might have to be taken into account when researching drugs aimed at brain disorders. This is exactly what happened to the Upjohn Company in the 1970s and 80s when it was developing a steroid drug that halted the lipid peroxidation damage to brain tissue caused by bleeding after a stroke, these Lazaroids. He says Upjohn sank 10 years and tens of millions of dollars into the development of the drug but came away with nothing. Why did they come up with nothing? Because Upjohn went to the FDA and said, We'd like these drugs approved. To the credit of everyone, they were considering the sex differences. And they saw that the drugs worked really well in men. But they didn't work in women. And the FDA said, we can't buy the argument. We're not going to approve them for everybody. The argument Upjohn made was, well, let's approve them, and it will benefit the men. And then hopefully, maybe it'll benefit some of the women. But the FDA wouldn't buy, uh, uh, buy the argument. So what happened? It died. The issue died, people moved away, people moved on to other things, Upjohn no longer exists. But only in the last several weeks, I've been able to find out that all the information that shows that Lazaroids work and work really well in men exists, it's been published. And so I'm working on an article right now entitled, Is it Time to Resurrect Lazaroids? <laughs> My answer is yes. Because think about this. We're laughing, but how many, how many men have suffered and died in the last 20 years as a result of what amounts to a false assumption, an assumption that there really can't be a sex difference that big in the effectiveness of a drug to treat stroke? So it's time for this assumption to go. We heard that previously, that sometimes we have to challenge our assumptions, and, and this is one that, that, that needs to go. Uh, I'm guessing that I'm around eight minutes at this point. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, again, say thank you to uh, Phyllis, wherever she is, and the society. Um, status quo doesn't change without someone forcing the issue. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this effort and, and proud that you asked me to speak here tonight. And now I have to go catch a plane. Thank you.